Part 1. You will hear a talk between a customer and a travel agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Good morning. I'd like to book a flight to Toronto, please. Certainly. Flying from Sydney? Yes. On Thursday, please. Thursday the 16th, right? There are three flights that day. Do you prefer flying with any particular airline? I've heard that Air Canada is good, but expensive. Is there a big difference in prices between the airlines? I'll be flying business class. Yes, there is. Air Canada is the most expensive airline at $4,000 to $6,000 for business class, depending on the date of return. Qantas is $3,000 to $6,000, and Pacific, the budget airline, charges between $2,000 and $3,500. Wow, that's quite a difference in prices. I'm returning on from Wednesday 22nd, so could you check the return prices for me? Sure. Let me just enter the return date into the computer. OK. Air Canada has tickets for $4,600. Qantas has them for $4,200. Pacific has tickets for $3,200. Those prices all include taxes and surcharges. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Before I make a decision, I would like to know the departure and arrival times, in both directions. Of course. Let's look at Air Canada first. Leaves Sydney at 10am and arrives in Toronto at 10am, local time. There's a stopover in Vancouver. The Qantas flight leaves Sydney at 1.45 and arrives at 10.15am. There's also a stopover in Vancouver, but it's shorter than the Air Canada one. Pacific flies via Los Angeles and leaves at 6.15, arriving at 11.55 p.m. Oh, that doesn't sound very convenient. Flying by Pacific, I mean. Well, budget airlines do offer cheaper tickets, but they are often not so advantageous in other ways. How about the returned flights? Let me check. The Air Canada flight leaves Toronto at 4 o'clock and arrives at 6 o'clock local time. The Qantas flight leaves at 9am and arrives at 11am, local time in Sydney. Pacific. Uh, the Pacific flight leaves Toronto at 10.25 and arrives at 6.10 local time in Sydney. Again, not very convenient timing. No, it isn't. Are the stopovers the same as on the outward journey? Yes, they are. Well, I have a business appointment on Wednesday the 22nd in the morning. So, unfortunately, I can't take the Qantas flight. The Pacific flight times are too inconvenient, so I'll take the Air Canada flight, even though it's more expensive. Right, I'll book that for you, shall I? Do you have your passport with you? Yes, I do. Here you are. Thank you. I'll just enter your details. OK. Could you just check this printout? Make sure that I've spelt your name correctly and have written your passport number correctly too. Will you be paying by credit card? Yes, I have a company credit card. Here you are. Oh, my name is Reese with a C, not with an S. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll correct that. R-E-E-C-E. -E. And my given names are hyphenated. Mary hyphen Anne. With an E. Oh, you've got that. Sorry. OK. Mary hyphen Anne. Joined together with a hyphen. Is the passport number OK? 
Yes. Could you give me an official invoice, please? I need it for my company. Certainly. Shall I use the company name as it appears on the credit card? ABC Stocks. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Could you sign here and here? Thank you. I'll just print out your ticket. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a monologue. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Good afternoon, everyone. I am here to give you a talk on tenancy agreements and other legalities. If you rent a flat or a house or bedsit, you will have a tenancy agreement or lease. This is a written legal agreement between you, the tenant, and the property owner, the landlord. Tenancy agreements should normally contain information about the amount of rent, the length of the tenancy, and what rights you and your landlord will have under the law. In most cases, you will have an assured shorthold tenancy, which means that your landlord cannot ask you to leave without a good reason during the first six months. Although these rights offer you some protection, it is still your responsibility to check the tenancy agreement thoroughly and make sure you agree with the terms. Do not sign the tenancy agreement if you do not know what all of it means. If you do not fully understand your rights, Show your tenancy agreement to an advisor in the accommodation office or student welfare office at your university or college and ask for help. You can also get help from a housing advice centre, law centre or citizens advice bureau. When you do sign the tenancy agreement, make sure you get a copy to keep for yourself, in case you need to check any details later on. The landlord may also ask you to sign an inventory a list of all the items in the property, pieces of furniture, kitchen items, etc. If so, make sure you get a copy of this as well. Check that it is correct and that any existing damage to these items is included before signing it. If your landlord does not provide an inventory, you should make one yourself and send a copy to the landlord. Let's take a look at payments. Before you move into private accommodation, you will probably be asked to pay a deposit equivalent to one month's rent. Make sure you get a receipt for any deposit or fees you have paid. When you leave the accommodation, if you have paid all your bills and caused no damage to the property, your full deposit will be paid back to you. If you are renting through an accommodation agency, you may also be asked to pay fees for preparing tenancy agreements and administration. You should also keep a written record of all the rent payments that you make, as you make them. If you have a dispute with your landlord, or you get behind with your rent, you should get advice as soon as possible. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Remember that if you live in the same building as your landlord, or you have a room in a student or youth hostel, or university college accommodation, 
then this will affect how secure your tenancy will be. If you do not share any living space with the landlord or a member of their family, apart from means of access like an entrance hall or a staircase, or are a student living in halls of residence, or any other type of accommodation where an educational institution is the landlord, you will have basic protection from eviction. Your landlord will have to end your tenancy first, either by waiting for the end of the fixed term you agreed for the tenancy, or by giving you at least four weeks written notice in writing to quit or through getting a court order. Before you have to leave, if you share living space, for example a kitchen, living room or bathroom, with your landlord or are in a student or youth hostel, you will be what is termed an excluded tenant, which means that you are outside the protection of the UK law which regulates tenancies and will not have security of tenure. All the landlord has to do to evict you is to give you notice, although they must give you a reasonable amount of time in which to leave. If you have problems with accommodation, contact the accommodation office or students' union at your university or college. If you need specialist or legal help, contact a law centre in your local Citizens Advice Bureau who will be able to tell you your rights as a tenant and the rights of your landlord. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk between a professor and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Good morning, Clara. Take a seat. Right, I've read your first draft of your project on housing. Well done. Thank you. I know it's only a first draft, though, so I'm sure you have some suggestions on how it can be improved. I was very nervous at first because it wasn't my first choice of topic. I had wanted to do something on voting patterns, but getting information, well, it didn't look possible within the time frame. Don't worry. I think that you have made a good choice. Yes, a comparison of the factors influencing house prices. Very topical. Definitely. There seems to be something about housing prices in the newspapers every day. I just wanted to compare the different factors. You know, location, the proximity of facilities such as schools. As I said, a good choice of topic. Now, the first part is very well done. You clearly introduce what you are going to look at, why and how. Do you think that I have covered enough points there? I think so. Did you have anything else in mind? You know, something else you'd like to cover? Well, a friend suggested that I might include crime rates. Actually, that's a very good idea. You might consider it. It is something that many people take into account, consciously or otherwise. When choosing a place to live, Nowadays the police are required to keep quite detailed statistics on crime, and you can get them fairly easily. I mean, it's easy enough to ask for them, but it might take a while for the police to get them to you. OK, I'll make a note of that. Contact police for crime statistics. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now, I have to say that I found the middle part more difficult to get through. Oh, I thought I had done that rather well. Don't worry, it's not awful. It's just that, well, try to take a uniform approach. Use one for each criteria people use when choosing housing. That way you're comparing like with like rather than different things. I see. So I should stick with one as far as possible. Yes, that does seem logical. So I don't really need to get more data or write much more. Instead, I need to change. I've got it. It just makes it a lot easier to read. That's the main thing. Yes, of course. How about the conclusion? Based on the information you've provided, I think that you've done very well. You'll have to see if the new information you include changes your conclusion at all. It probably won't make a big difference, but you might see variations in some areas. Okay. Do you think that I used appropriate headings, and is the bibliography okay? I know that a lot of professors look long and hard at that, whilst most students think it's unimportant. Yes, professors find the bibliography very useful. It tells us where you are getting your information from. And whether those sources are appropriate, your bibliography is fine, but you might consider changing the format. Here's a printout of the most widely accepted format. You can keep that. Thank you. And the headings? I made a few notes. Here are some suggestions. Don't feel that you have to use them. I won't be offended. But some of your headings are long-winded, whereas others are relatively short, as they should be. Thank you. I'll take a look at these later. How long did you work on the whole thing? Well, two months, perhaps on average of three hours a day, not more than that. Probably a one hundred and fifty hours. That's about what I would recommend. Anything less than a hundred and twenty hours is going to be detrimental to the project. You'll probably need another fifty hours work on it in total. You've still got a month, so you should manage it easily. Yes. A couple of hours a day, easy. I'd suggest that you come back to see me in oh about let's say three weeks' time. Then you should be virtually finished, and I can have another look before you do your final proofreading, before handing it in. Okay, I'll see you after one of the seminars to make an appointment. Is that okay? Certainly. Thanks, Clara. Thank you, Professor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a presentation on scholarship and funding. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to this presentation on scholarships and funding. If you are hoping for help with funding your studies in the UK, you need to get working on this as soon as you can. It is almost impossible to make arrangements for financial support once you have left your own country. Start by inquiring with your own Ministry of Education or Department of Education. Your local British Council office can provide details of awards available. Including those offered by UK institutions themselves, you'll also find information and a scholarships database on their website. The main scholarship schemes available for international students include British Education Scholarships, Commonwealth Scholarships, Foreign Office Scholarships, and Overseas Students Research Awards. British Education Scholarships are prestigious awards. 
enabling talented international students to study in the UK at postgraduate level. Only students studying for at least one academic year are eligible. About 2,000 new scholarships are currently awarded each year, and there are plans to expand the program further. There are three types of scholarship. The first is a full award, where all the fees, a living allowance, and travel to and from the UK are paid for. Then there is a fees-only award, where all or part of the fees are paid. Finally, there is a partial award, where a combination of the fees and the allowances are paid. The value of the scholarship will vary, depending on the type of the award, the length of the course, and the country from which the student comes. But it is up to a maximum of £20,000. Contact the British Council or the British Embassy in your own country for details. You must be resident in your home country when you apply. Commonwealth scholarships are awards mainly for postgraduate study, although funding for undergraduate study may be possible if there are no suitable undergraduate courses in your home country. You must be a citizen of a Commonwealth country, including the UK. A university degree or equivalent is usually required. Apply to the British Council office in your country. You must be resident in your own country when you apply. About 3,000 of these scholarships are awarded each year, and their value ranges from £5,000 to £15,000. Foreign Office scholarships are a joint initiative by the Foreign Office and certain UK higher education institutions. The awards are normally given for taught postgraduate courses. In rare cases, an award may be made for undergraduate study if the course is not available at an institution in your home country. They are funded by the Foreign Office and participating UK higher education institutions. You must normally be under 35 years of age. You must be resident in a developing country and you must not be currently employed by your government or by an international organisation. You should be planning to study a subject related to development and be fluent in English. Apply directly to one of the participating institutions. You can ask for a list of participating institutions from the British Embassy in your country or your local British Council office. Only about 500 of these awards are made each year and their value ranges from £7,000 to £12,000. Overseas Students Research Awards are awards for full-time postgraduate study for a period of one year. They make up the difference between home and overseas students' fees. They are funded by the Ministry of Education. You must be a postgraduate research student at a publicly funded higher education institution in the UK. You will need to demonstrate academic merit and research potential. Application forms are available from UK higher education institutions, so contact the one where you want to study. For further information, contact the OSRA office via their website, www.osra.org. Actually, you can email them at osra at osra.org. On average, 1,000 of these scholarships are awarded each year, and the maximum amount is £25,000 per scholarship. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.